Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first Black Voters Matter Policy Corner of 2024, where we are about to dive into this messy, ongoing fight for our educational sovereignty and autonomy and how this shapes education for the foreseeable future. This is a continuation of sorts, if you will, from last year around critical race theory and bans on Black history. Uh, we had quite a bit of thought-provoking thought discussions on this so-called war on woke. Tonight, we will hear firsthand how students and faculty are being imp impacted by the latest assaults on higher education via these DEI bans, hostile takeovers of HBCU boards, right-wing-led school closure threats, and the larger implications of last year's Supreme Court decision to eliminate affirmative, affirmative action. As always, Black Voters Matter is a safe space for our righteous rage, and we have a dynamic panel for you all tonight. So let's get into it. I'll pass the mic over to my colleague and sister in the movement space, Anisha Hardy. She wears many hats, <clears throat> but I know her best through her work as the executive director of Alabama Values, Pro Alabama Values Progress. Anisha, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Ryan, and in the Black Voters Matter family for inviting me to ground us before we take off um, into this timely and critical discussion around the alarming trends um, of attacks against diversity, equity, and inclusion um, happening across the country, but particularly across the South. Now, these attacks are not isolated incidents, but are part of a broader pattern that seeks to undermine the progress made. You know, um, I've been saying lately that this isn't just policymaking. Um, this is a war against progress. Uh, this is a war against justice. Um, this is a war against us. So let's be clear. The assault on, you know, DEI is a direct assault on the very essence of our humanity, um, you know, community. Uh, it is a calculated move to uphold white supremacy uh, and to further marginalize and disenfranchise Black, Indigenous, people of color communities. You know, these attacks are aimed at erasing uh, the acknowledgement of systemic racism and the need for intentional um, actions to dismantle it. Um, and, you know, and when I say that these aren't isolated um, or coordinated, you know, um, attacks, here's what I mean. Let's look at the receipts, y'all. So in Alabama, we have, you know, Senate Bill 129, which was signed into law by Governor Kay Ivey, and it just seeks to get rid of the ability of public colleges to promote and maintain DEI initiatives um, by banning DEI offices and programs, uh, you know, it is, you know, this law is a blatant attempt to whitewash our educational system. Uh, you know, it is truly absurd to label discussions about race, discrimination, and equity um, as divisive uh, concepts, you know, especially when we consider the very foundation of this country. The United States was supposedly built on the principles of liberty and justice, right? But yet, you know, its history is deeply marred by the systemic oppression of Black, Indigenous, people of color communities. You know, um, to deny the importance of these conversations is to ignore the very lived realities of millions of Americans in the ongoing struggle for equality. You know, it is, you know, this is just an attempt to erase the complexities of our past in present. You know, it's still present. People like to think that we've progressed, right? You know, and to silence the voices calling for a more just and equitable future. You know, and then in Texas, you have Senate Bill 17, which has been signed into law, um, dismantles all diversity, equity, and inclusion programs at public institutions. This law is a direct, you know, attack on the efforts to create a more inclusive and equitable, you know, educational environment. Uh, and then in Tennessee, the recent decision to eliminate, you know, the Tennessee State Board, along with the attempt, uh, attempted closure of Mississippi Valley State and the accreditation challenges faced by Shaw University, you know, this represents a coordinated effort to undermine and attack HBCUs. You know, these actions threaten the, the safe spaces that HBCUs provide, you know, for Black students to learn and thrive. And, um, you know, and this, this is part of a, of, of a larger pattern, you know, that are attacking these type of institutions, um, you know, and in Florida, the Stop Woke Act and other legislation has, you know, led to the dismantling of DEI offices, you know, and programs. And now I really don't care what they say when they're on the floor debating these bad legislations, you know, and bills, because, you know, however way they spin it, these laws are not about promoting fairness and neutrality. They are about entrenching inequality in society and silencing dissent. They are about maintaining a status quo that benefits the privileged few at the expense of many. 
the whole color colorblind and race neutral arguments used to justify these laws are nothing but you know a smoke it's nothing but a smoke screen to normalize lawful segregation and discrimination you know i believe that dei is not a luxury it is a necessity it is you know it is about acknowledging the historical and ongoing injustices that these communities face and as someone whose work focuses on narrative and messaging, you know, I would be remiss if I did not mention the, flat, the fact that, you know, what we are seeing is a trend, um, you know, of the term DEI being weaponized in a very disingenuous narrative campaign to push for legislation that is at its core anti people of color. These bills cloaked in the guise of opposing DEI initiatives are, you know, not about fostering this unity and promoting, you know, meritocracy. It's instead, you know, it's really aimed at, you know, to dismantle the very structures um, to, that, that have been designed, you know, to address these historical injustices um, that we face. And so I am glad that we are having this conversation this evening um, because, you know, as this legislation, you know, continues, these type of legislations continue to pass, we must not be complacent. You know, we must resist these regressive, you know, policies at every turn and we must continue to fight. And one way to do so is to make sure that, you know, we amplify voices that are directly impacted by these policies, that we make sure that we close the knowledge gap around what's happening because knowledge is power. And one way to keep a group disempowered is to create barriers to information. And, you know, and we must have these discussions in our spaces so that we can put out these counter narratives because who controls the narrative controls the power. And so with that, I will turn it over <laughs> to our moderator for this evening. And thank you all for, you know, for having me. I encourage those who are watching to chime in whatever platform you're looking at this on in the comment sections. There will be a Q&A. Please put your questions, you know, in the chat. Uh, you know, this is this is us. This is for us. So let's have let's have this critical and timely conversation this evening. Thank you. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Dr. Wes Bellamy from the Virginia State University. I think it's really important that first and foremost, we show some love to our Black Voters Matter family. You can give a virtual round of applause for them convening this quarterly talk and always answering the call and standing up for us like they always do. Now, tonight, I can assure you, you know, y'all thought the kickoff was dope. Doc bought the fire. But I'm telling you, this conversation by not only some of the leading uh, student activists and leaders in the country, but also some of the thought leaders in the country about this topic specifically. And, you know, WTF, what the, well, we'll leave it there. What's going on with diversity, equity, and inclusion? And I know, you know, we're all hearing all of this stuff about this and about that, but we are really looking forward to not only hearing from you, but from some of our panelists about exactly what it is that we have to do in order for us to move forward. And again, I know y'all see it, the war on woke, attacks on critical race theory, all these tools to normalize segregation and guys, the colorblind and this these race neutral arguments, we're not having it. And we're gonna speak up like we always do. So I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation. And with that being said, we're gonna bring in some of our dynamic panelists, starting with the honorable, uh, lovely, incredible Dr. Kimberly Brown Pelham. Y'all give a virtual round of applause for Dr. Brown Pelham. Yeah, 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 yeah. Next up, we got the incomparable leader of NCAT. You know, I'm a little old. I guess I'm an unk now because I call North Carolina ENT just ENT. <laughs> and I heard it's NCAT now. Uh, the, the lovely and intelligent Miss Kylie Rice. What's up, Miss Rice? Good to see Hello. you. Hello. Thank you all. And definitely last but not least, my main man, from the TSU, Tennessee State University. Y'all been causing some havoc down there. I heard y'all asking some folks to run y'all y'all money. Absolutely, man. So respect to my dear brother, uh, future Samson, future doctor, Samson Cook. <laughs> Let's give brother Cook a round of applause, virtual round of applause. So yo, I wanna give y'all the opportunity to introduce yourself. I'm from down south, so we believe in ladies first. Let's start with you, uh, Dr. Brown Pelham. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh-oh, you're on mute. You don't mute my sister. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me this evening. I look forward to hearing the views from the rest of our panel. Uh, my name again is Kimberly Brown Pelham. I am born and raised in Montgomery, Alabama, which is both the home of the Confederacy and the Civil Rights Movement. So there's always tension and intersection there. I am honored to teach at the highest of Seven Hills in Tallahassee, Florida, otherwise known as FAMU. 
Thank you, Doc. We really appreciate you. Madam Rice, Madam Future Dr. Rice, come on and join us. <laughs> Hello, I am Kylie Rice. I am a junior honors political science student and I attend North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, the largest HBCU. I'm from Roswell, Georgia, but I attend school in Greensboro, North Carolina. So I see both sides of the fight as well, being from Georgia, just seeing all the suppressive laws that sometimes happen over there. And just being so close to Florida, too, we see what's going on down in Florida specifically. And I can't wait to talk about that. But I'm really excited. And thank you all for having me here tonight. Thank you for joining us, Doc. And, you know, again, my brother, Brother Cook, man, let us know a little bit about yourself. Good brother. Good evening, everyone. I am Samson Cook. I'm a freshman political science major attending the illustrious Tennessee State University. And I would just like to express my gratitude for allowing me to um, express my um, concerns the, um, about the uh, DEI implications of the state government currently. Thank you so much. Nah, man. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate each of you and your contributions to this conversation. So let's just get right into it. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of general questions uh, for, for each of you, whomever would like to go first. Do you see the DEI bans or the war on woke and the attack on critical race theory as tools to normalize segregation under the guise of colorblind or race neutral arguments or, is or excuse me, or is segregation already a common experience um, for students maybe at your institution or those who you may know at PWIs and the like? Oh, I can go ahead and start off the conversation. Sure. So I think specifically like this policy concerning DEI, it's not something that's new. I don't think this is something that all of a sudden just came about and just started impacting people. I think this is just a new form of Jim Crow laws. Like every time they start getting something, they're just going to change it into something new. So whether it's book bans, whether it's DEI, whether it's critical race theory, they all have the same concept underlying, which they're threatened. They're threatened by the successes of Black people. They're threatened by HBCU specifically because a t is 14,000 of the smartest, brightest Black students coming together. And spaces like that scare a lot of other people. I know we see the importance of HBCUs, but unfortunately, that's not seen in other sides of the argument, unfortunately. So I think it's really important as students that we recognize that, that it's not just something that kind of came about just recently. This is a tool. This is to employ segregation to continue keeping us down in the system. So. Yeah, yeah, well said. Brother Cook, what are your thoughts? I totally agree. I feel like that these DEI implications are used to segregate our Black students within our HBCUs. I feel mm -hmm. like that um, it's more of a weapon, not saying so it's like uh, when we think about when we're not using this, the word like racism, I feel like mm -hmm. this is just a word to cover up their blatant racist attacks. So I think it's a blatant we a blunt weapon to, um, again, um, put us um down per se. yeah okay okay dr brown tell them what what are your thoughts the panelists are correct <laughs> this isn't new um you know i always ask folks in fact i was walking with a friend this morning and we're both mothers and she shared mm -hmm. some concerns about her child not having access to thoughtful and inclusive curriculum and I responded with, when has the curriculum ever been inclusive? And so right. I think a lot of the uh, anti-DNI efforts have to do with speaking to their voter base um, and inciting fear among a broad population in order to, again, um, excite those voters that would perhaps uh, support the legislators who are supporting this kind of legislation. Yeah, I want to I want to stick with you for this next question, because I think you're touching on something that is really interesting um, and specifically from your perspective and vantage point. Uh, one, being from Alabama, uh, the, the home of the cap, home of the Confederacy. I think over here in Virginia, we call ourselves the capital of the Confederacy and we're trying to get rid of all of them uh, there and the like. But being from Alabama and then currently teaching at FAM, um, in your view, how do anti-diversity laws impact the campus climate for students and faculty, uh, particularly in terms of academic freedom? And, you know, like open dialogue, like overall learning environment. How do these policies and or laws like impact that from your opinion, from your finish point? 
So first and foremost, I want to keep my job, Governor DeSantis. Hi, how are you if you're on the call? <laughs> so I'm gonna be careful in how I answer that question, right? But I mean, again, it's not new. Um, it, anybody who studies just a slice of our history, specifically as it relates to the pursuit of education, knows that you know, we can go all the way back to the enslavement period and Booker T. Washington, who ultimately uh, helps to establish the Tuskegee University while we're talking about HBCUs. He talks about as a little boy, his mother having to uh, essentially steal a, a reading book um, so that she could teach her children literacy very early on. So in terms of blocking access to education, that is a very old story. Furthermore, when you're talking about an inclusive style of educating people, that has never been a norm. That, that's never been a norm uh, for the nation. Uh, in fact, when we talk about the roots of Black studies, um, that movement traces back to the 1960s when Black college students began to challenge these prevailing academic norms that overlooked the experiences and contributions of African Americans. And so, the responsibility has always been on us to shift the system, not the other way around. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I just want to put on something really fast. In terms of the story that Dr. Pelham just shared about just seeing yourself in like curriculum or seeing it in history books and stuff, like growing up, I really never saw, like we only hear about the same few names like Rosa Parks, um, Martin Luther King, like it's just never anyone new that ever gets brought to the table. And, and unfortunately, aren't taught correctly. <laughs> yeah, like we just never actually hear about substance, like in terms of history, like what did our people do? What did they do then? What are they doing now? We just ever, we don't ever hear anything about that. And unfortunately, we always have to do our own research and go into an HBCU. You do have to hear your you do have to do your own research, but we do thankfully get a little more discussion where we do kind of bounce off ideas and hear new names where we then do our own research. They at least open the door, but in terms of like straight curriculum, we were never really there. And unfortunately they're trying to strip the little bit that we are, so. Yeah, and I, and I, wanna, I wanna stick with you, um, Ms. Rice, uh, soon to be Dr. Rice. To that point in terms of, I think what you just alluded to was really interesting about not being taught correctly. And I, and I heard Dr. Brown Pelham say, yeah, you know, you just, you are not taught correctly. You were taught incorrectly, which is accurate in, in your, um, there's, a, there's a synergy from my vantage point in your quest for knowledge, similar to uh, the Honorable Booker T. Washington. I mean, I know some of you may have read his book, uh, Up From Slavery, and he talked about setting the clots backward at the mind. That's so right. Yeah, so he could go and, and go to school and then still go and do his work. And he did whatever he needed to in order to be able to to obtain his education and, and be able to, to learn and or read. So so for you, Miss Rice, and for you, Mr. Cook, for those like you two are already um, and I'm speaking this into existence. You two are already bound and destined to do phenomenal things and you're going to do. You already are doing these things. You're, you're leading the culture. You're making impacts. But for those who are coming behind you, who also have not been taught correctly or who have been uh, excluded from certain opportunities. Um, what do you two believe that we should be doing collectively for younger folks to ensure that they have the opportunities to be able to learn prior to getting to these institutions of, of higher learning? Um, I'm going to say it starts at the home. Like it really starts where you're raised at, who you're raised around, those conversations that are started in the house are just so important. So mm -hmm. I think as a collective, we need to be educating students really early on about their rights, what they should be doing in their off time, because as much as they're scrolling on TikTok and stuff, they need to pick up a book too. So mm -hmm. it's just about educating our own selves, encouraging the people who come after us to educate their own themselves as well. And yeah. we also have to kind of open the door for people to come after us too. So whenever I talk to students, prospective students specifically, about ANT, I'm telling them ways that they can get money, ways that they can get involved in the community, ways to really get your foot in the door at ANT, because it's yeah. not about me, it's about who will come after me. And I really want that door to stay open for hundreds of thousands of students to come after me once I graduate. 
Mm, well said, well said. Brother Cook, what are your thoughts? Absolutely. Uh, I 100% agree with Miss Rice, but I also would say that we, as a collective, I believe it's our obligation to serve our community as well. I believe that it is us to, it is our duty for us to share the knowledge that we know with the younger generation. So I believe doing talk shows like this is very, very essential. I feel yeah. like um, just getting in their faces is, is essential. And I feel like that we just need to continue to push out the word that these things are happening, that these issues are prevalent. And so again, yeah, I believe that we should encourage the youth to get involved with these type of issues early. Yeah, yeah, you know, one of the things um, that I, I loved hearing you two talk about, one in, in terms of it starts at the home, it starts early, and Brother Cook saying, you know, the collective. I often challenge my students. Um, so I used to be the, the vice oh. mayor of Council Virginia, and now serve as the political science department chair of Virginia State. But we often often challenge uh, our students about. Who's going to take on the task of doing the community work? Mm. And what happens when the parents who also haven't had the opportunity or the ability to be able to learn these things because it wasn't taught to them and they're just trying to work and or survive because the systems that we have in our communities are not often advantageous for us. Those of us who have this knowledge and those, who have, those of us who have aspired and ascended to certain levels, we have an obligation to give our time, our talent, and our treasure to our community. So I was really, really pleased to hear uh, both of you um, touch on that and, and kudos to you for sure. Um, Dr. Pelham Brown, I wanna come and ask you another question. One that, that is not going to jeopardize uh, your your job because you know I, I see all those books back there and I'm sure they're not free um, <laughs> and you gotta eat, right? So in Florida uh, specifically, um, what are some things in which you believe that our listeners or the persons uh, who may even be on this panel or colleagues uh, who may be tapping in at a later time, what can we do to support efforts on the ground in Florida in terms of educating our communities um, and ensure that, you know, again, we're combating DEI in our own way? Or not combating DEA, DEI, but ensuring that our folks have access to DEI. So it's always been community centered. Anytime that anytime throughout history that we've seen success for ourselves, it's always been a result of the many and not the few, right? And so when we talk about access to education in general, uh, for instance, in the state of Alabama, oftentimes when we talk about um, the history of HBCUs, the primary narrative that we're giving is that white philanthropists are responsible right. for the early rise of historically black colleges. And that's just not true, uh, specifically for ASU, for Tuskegee, for uh, Florida A&M. Uh, you're talking about formerly enslaved black folks who came together in community and decided that education was going to be the route uh, that changed the trajectory of their lives. The Mary and Nine uh, were nine um, formerly enslaved ind individuals who ultimately founded the Lincoln Normal School in Marion, Alabama. They scraped up $500 to mm. establish a school that would provide education to black folks in the post-Civil War era. Um, I don't have to tell y'all about the founding of Tuskegee, and that's not to say that uh, white philanthropy was not involved, but they were not at the center of Black folks who exercised their own agency in changing the outcome of their lives and the definition of freedom for themselves. And the same thing is true for FAMU and our founding. Um, it was Black men who met at a what was called a Colored Men's Conference in Jacksonville, Florida. And they mm -hmm. decided then, right, this is 1887 we were founded. They decided then that, no, we don't need to consider Destin. We don't need to consider Tampa. We don't need to consider Jacksonville as where we set up shop. We will do so in Tallahassee because it is the seat. It is the legislative seat of the state. And we know because of who we are, because of what we represent, um, as African descent people, we need to be in front of those people who make the laws that will influence ultimately the outcomes of our lives. And so they they established FAMU in Tallahassee, and we have been engaged um, in 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 we have been contesting uh, state government ever since. Uh, when you talk about duplication laws, you mentioned earlier um, Tennessee State, right? And uh, getting is just due in terms of state provisions, 
right? Uh, we can see that across the country, um, University of Maryland versus University of Maryland Eastern Shore, which is the yeah. black campus, uh, right? Uh, yeah. so that fam, you just engaged in some, uh, in, a, in a legal battle with the state of Florida. Uh, Knight versus the state of Alabama is the infamous case whereby the state actually settled and admitted um, that it had been underfunding uh, historically black colleges for um, decades. So this issue again is an old one. Um, that is my way of saying that it, it has always been community. It has always been many of us um, to step up and teach one another, share knowledge, exchange in wisdom. Uh, when you talk about uh, Carter G. Woodson and the establishment of what we now know as Black History Month, that came out of his work, uh, his vision, um, and his partnerships really with churches, sororities, fraternities, and other Black historians who had and maintained, I think that's so important, not only did they have connections to, to community, but they maintain connection to community. So what is the point in calling me doctor, you doctor, or anybody else, um, given those titles, if we can't find ways to channel um, that knowledge to those folks around us? So I, I think it's always been community-centered. Yeah, and, and, and I, wanna, I wanna segue, and I don't wanna belabor or stay on this point for too long, but you said so much. That I would love to unpack just a little bit. No, 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 no. It was it was great, um, but really, what instantaneously came to mind, or I think what consistently came to mind uh, as you were talking, was these these stories about our foundations that show the tenacity and the resilience of our people that far too many of us do not know. And I guess a follow up question to you, Dr. Brown Pelham, if, if you if you could indulge us and educate us some more, because I feel like I'm in class and, uh, and I'm, I'm thirsting to listen. Uh, how do we and I understand, you know, we have to go from a community aspect, but how do we get more of these stories again about our foundations out? How do we tell and talk more about about again, like like our starts for so many of the bare rocks of our institution? I think it's just about collabor collaboration. And we don't have any excuse, right? Because mm -hmm. when we talk about Dr. Winston, we talk at turn of the century, we're talking 1920. There is no Instagram, there is no right. email. And right. these right. Black folks are figuring out ways to literally publish, popularize, and legitimize material related to the Black past. And they're doing so successfully, so much so that Dr. Woodson even uh, threatens to cancel Black History Month. That was he said, y'all ain't taking it serious enough. Y'all only call my office during February. This is year long work. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's absolutely possible. I think we need to, as the young people say, put some respect on, <laughs> on uh, these uh, Black folks who have uh, historical knowledge. There are so many both professionally trained uh, African-American historians and so many griots in our community. Uh, so it can be as simple as um, making sure that collaborations take place between historians like me and maybe, I don't know, the, the, the marketing dude on campus to make sure mm -hmm. that you know, we're connected to the local YMCA, we're connected to the to the youth center. And it can also be something as simple as making sure that you record your grandmother when she speaks. You know, she's teaching you. Um, so I, I think if we can get past uh, some of the smoke related to, uh, and, and I don't mean to suggest that um, these anti-DNI efforts are not real, they, they very much so are. Um, but what is also real is our record of self-determination and saving ourselves. And so if we could get past some of the smoke of what we're seeing now and sort of um, spend some time appreciating what we've already done and maybe explore some ways to continue to do that, I think the blueprint is there. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I really, I think we all can attest that. We really appreciate you sharing that. Um, so we have another student leader, uh, my dear brother, Justin Williams, who's gonna be coming in and joining us. 
Where's my man, Justin? Justin, what's hey. up, my brother? How you doing? All right, man. How you doing, man? Tell us a little bit about yourself uh, as you're joining us. Okay. Um, my name is Justin Williams. I'm a sophomore political science major, double minor in pre-law and public policy administration at the eminent Tougaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I'm here to shed light on the DEI bans and things like that that just really holds us back in the state of Mississippi. Well, let's let's jump into that really quickly. We've been discussing this at length as well as uh, some historical data and information. Mm -hmm. So, so Justin, you're at Tougaloo, the place that allegedly had the largest uh, homecoming um, out of all HBCUs this year. Allegedly, I don't know about you know. I don't even know how y'all fit all the people at the school, but that's mm -hmm. another story. Here, there. <laughs> But but in all seriousness, down down in Mississippi, there are some very regressive state laws and policies that are being passed that are uh, tr tremendously impacting institutions like yours. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on specifically in Mississippi and again, how it's impacting Tougaloo? Um, so from my knowledge, um, based on all the three HBCUs, we were really affected just with the Senate Bill 2726. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't directly targeting our school because we're a private independent HBCU. Mm -hmm. um, however, it was targeting our surrounding HBCUs and Jackson State, Jackson okay. State Alcorn, um, okay. Mississippi Valley State. Mm -hmm. And the thing with that is we're not able to go over there and stay accustomed with our own culture. And with Mississippi being the, like I said, one of the poorest states, it's hard to go over there and keep the same resources that we're steady trying to build to pass down to the next generation. And it's somewhat, we use it as a crutch. And it's like when the policy is put in place, it's taking everything away from us, taking away all hope, all strategy and all plans that we have for the future. Um, with me being a first generation college student, I'm still getting acclimated with everything pertaining to policies, laws, and just simply college culture. And so with me coming here, I was able to gain a better mindset because I previously went to the University of Mississippi, a PWI. Um, while attending there, of course, they had the resources. They had all the opportunities, but it wasn't targeted specifically for black men. With me being a black man, the only mm. black person and the only man in my major, mm. I felt out of place. I wasn't able to truly accept and understand the college life that I was experiencing. But when I attended Tougaloo College, I was able to truly connect with my professors, with my advisors and all. And ever since I came here, I was able to do the internships and take all those opportunities. And I mm -hmm. felt with the policy that they were trying to put in place, it was actually just ruining it for other black men. And that's wow. my true passion. So yeah, when it comes to it, it's like the same opportunities I'm being afforded. I just think about my little brother who's getting ready to come into college, he won't be afforded those same opportunities. And I feel yeah. as a state of Mississippi, we need more solidarity, not only from my minorities, African-Americans, but from all minorities and the major races. Mm, mm. Well said, well said. You, you, you bring up a very interesting point that I love to hear from uh, Ms. Rice and Mr. Cook about solidarity and ways in which we combat DEI. Uh, I'd love to hear from your two perspectives and vantage points. How can we use specifically black solidarity to combat some of these DEI policies that we see in these other places? I say one specific strategy that I've employed on my campus is making things fun. I know that black people, we have to stay rooted in culture sometimes for things to really pop off. So the past um, two National Voter Registration Day events at the campus, I organized them to turn into block parties. So we mm -hmm. had meet the Greeks out there. We had a little party going on. We had giveaways. We had free t-shirts. We had free food. So we have to keep the culture sometimes when we want stuff to keep going. And yeah. going to an HBCU, of course, Black people love parties. Like, So what's there not to lose when we're going to combine a party with a serious matter in terms of education and a heavy topic for voter registration? So mm -hmm. I see the biggest strategy for just having everyone collectively come together has to do with the way that we're reaching out to people. And I feel like ANT does a great job in terms of seeing what the people want and kind of twisting it into more of a serious 
issue. So like we're addressing the voter registration, we're addressing education while we're out there. But of course, you're getting your free t-shirts, your food and everything as well. And I wanted to go back to one of the points you said earlier too about having it being our obligation to do so, because as I said, it's really important to recognize when you have privilege and going to an HBCU, being able to afford to attend an HBCU, that's privilege within itself. Not everyone can go to college. Not everyone can even graduate from high school. So Mm -hmm. it's really important that we use our knowledge, our resources, whatever we do have and bring it out into the greater community. And that's one thing that I really advocate for on behalf of myself and the students in North Carolina a t because we're situated in a part of East Greensboro that is not the best, um, we always make it a point to go into the community and pour back into them because as much as we're taking from them, we must be giving as well. So mm-hmm. one thing specifically that we did this past, I think October, I had a whole bunch of students, I'm in student government association. So I had my whole council come out with me and we registered local um, residents on how to vote and where to vote and who to vote for and things like that. Of course, keeping it nonpartisan, but just encouraging people to get out to vote, encouraging people of what resources they have. These are all ways to kind of unify because of course you don't need to just be unified on your campus community, but you need to reach into where your surroundings are as well, so. yeah. Well said, well said. Brother Cook, what are your thoughts? Okay, so in the case of Tennessee State University, um, we've done various of different, we have employed various different tactics into um, encouraging our students and informing our students about the issues um, that are prevalent within our institution. Um, one of the things that we do in Tennessee State University, we have these tall hall meetings. Um, we um, have our student leadership, our SGA president, SGA vice president, our student trustee, um, speak about these issues in a large setting. Uh, we give t-shirts, we have food served. And so we could, you know, incentive, incentivize um, students to come out and to actually learn about the um, issues that are um, going on. Another thing that we do, um, I'm part of the NAACP. I am the Get Out to Vote subcommittee chair on my campus. So one of the things that we're doing, I believe next week on the 17th of this month, we're going to have a voter registration drive. As again, it's going to be non-bipartisan, but it, it's, again, it's to encourage students to vote and to actually learn how the voting process works and how that affects legislation within the state and you know the nation. Um, lastly, um, one another thing that we do, um, we have a student trustee committee. Um, so what we what their job is is that we inform our students about again about the issues that are happening revolve revolving the university. But we use social media. Um, we post newsletters every month. We have these weekly updates um, with our student trustee, just to bridge that connection between them, the leadership of our school with you know the common student. And so I believe that yes, we do need to employ more tactics to re- resolve these issues. But again, what we do is we um, we inform our students about the issues that are prevalent. Well said, well said, well said. Well, we, we've been having a, a very thorough conversation. I wanna make sure that we provide people in the crowd and the audience the opportunity to ask any questions. Um, Ms. Haynes, do we have any questions from the audience? All right. No, we got some for the culture. All right, cool, 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 cool. All right, so look, I got, um, or or excuse me, I have have another question. So this one may be a little different. It's it's not necessarily uh, a DEI in terms of policy, but I do think it's related in this regard. Now, you know, I'm saying this as, as one individual, um, not Black Voters Matter saying this. This is, this is just me, Wes Bellamy, asking this question and saying this, right? I really feel like uh, DEI is the new way for a lot of white people specifically to call us the N-word. Um, and it's, it's coded language um, and dog whistling in a wide variety of different ways. How do you all feel um, when you hear people who are, and this is for the students, people your age speaking negatively and saying and or calling persons like yourself getting into positions, um, DEI hires or affirmative affirmative action hires or trying to make slight comments as if you're not qualified and things of that nature. I don't know if many of you saw um, the mayor of Baltimore, Maryland, Brandon Scott, be called a DEI elected official, even though He's been the mayor for going on four years now and doing very well in the city of Baltimore. So I'd love to hear from your students' perspective, like 
how do you all feel when you hear those things? And then as a follow up, do the students on your campus truly understand and or grasp how people are viewing them through this lens? Mm. Uh, okay, I'll start then. <laughs> I just wanted to see if anyone wanted to. Uh -huh. uh, so, I think first thing is the question about students. I think, and I'm going to address the question too in the audience, if you don't mind. Um, so, one thing specifically, I think students students get it to a certain extent, and I think the way to get students to care about it, or the way that I personally go about getting students to care, has to do with rooting it back to what they're passionate about. So when we're talking about, um, let's say housing. So you're just taught the same mm -hmm. that, you know, like you don't like the dorms that we have on campus. You really mm -hmm. wish that we had some updated dorms. And I kind of bridge the conversation through that lens then and say, okay, so have you ever went to like planning and zoning of the city? Like, do you know what permits that ANC has, where we're allowed to build? Do you know how much money we have? Do you know why we don't have as much money? Do you know who you elected into office last year? So it's those little conversations that start out with a passion is which make, which makes students kind of more aware to the issue and get them to grasp it further. So that's kind of my take in terms of grasping concepts because they are really difficult to understand. Like they're just really extensive and they go back generation. So the yeah. best way now is to always root it into what they're passionate about and what they care about. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like the other question, like how do I feel personally about DEI representatives and that whole, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's just, I think it's really frustrating, especially because if I was white, like I would be getting all the praise. Like, and it's just, you just have to see it for what it is. Like, I think the resume speaks for itself. And it's really unfortunate that the fact that the skin color is what determines yes or no sometimes for some people. So it's just frustrating, but it always propels me to keep going forward and educate the next person of the problems. Because just growing up, I saw in little things, like I was a gym. And when I was competing, it would be a panel of three white judges and the girl in front of me, the white girl in front of me, you know, would get a certain score. I do a better routine than her. I get a less score. And it's just like it was blatant things like that when yeah. I was younger and I just became unfortunately accustomed to it. But yeah. I think my HBCU has done a great job in validating student opinions, like making us feel heard telling us that the system is broken. They don't try to sit there and cover it up, especially certain professors. If it's a safe space, they make sure that it's truly safe. So yeah. they tell us, you know, you probably didn't get that job because of X, Y, and Z. They probably weren't comfortable with who you were. They probably didn't like that your cover letter talked about how you're a black woman and how you don't like the situations with police brutality. So it's just being loud and like taking up space in a room, but unfortunately it does have the repercussions. But one thing about me, I'm never gonna silence who I am just to get a job. You're either gonna like me who I am or you're just not gonna hire me, but it's frustrating. And of course like DE&I, like the critics who are saying like, you know, you're only getting hired for DE&I. I see DE&I as a tool of equity, like, I. I would have been overlooked otherwise, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to show you why I should have been hired, regardless of this is a quota, a statue, or not. So, okay, Dr. Rice, bring the fire. Okay, okay, uh, brother Cook, brother Williams, how, how do you feel or, or response to the question? You don't have to. I'm just. Upset. I could go. Um, so, in regards to the uh, the first part of the question, again, I agree with Rice. I'm very, very frustrated when I can achieve an accomplishment, and it's due to DEI. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I heard you talk about it, uh, Mr. B Dr. Bellamy, I really thought about epistemic credibility, um, especially with um, professors within our HBCUs and um, not just HBCUs, but within um, universities around the nation. And so how that affects, you know, DEI and epistemic credibility, it, it's sad. You know, um, I feel like that I should be seen for who I am and not just for my skin color, for my accomplishments. And so um, when I, I could say, I'm just gonna throw it out the ballpark, uh, DEI scholar accomplishes this, DEI scholar accomplishes that, it's frustrating, it's really frustrating. But in terms of the second part of the question with the students, I really, it's along the lines of what uh, Ms. Rice said, but I really, what I employ, I really, um, so I like to emphasize how these issues affect our students on campus. 
Um, so another thing with us, we have a housing issue, um, but hall um, with the um, residence hall, you want to um, have a better, you know, showers, um, have a better, um, just, you know, better quality of life, you know, better quality, um, just better quality room. And yeah. so when we, specifically with us, we're underfunded $2.1 billion. What I really like to do is to say, what do you imagine when you, if you had that $2.1 billion? What do you think, how much better would your student life be if our school was allotted $2.1 billion to have better dorms, you know, yeah. better recreation, better food, such and such, better academics, more opportunities, more opportunities to go abroad, more opportunities to have scholarships. You know, tell them how these issues affect them personally. Right. Well said, well said. Mr. Williams, any thoughts? Yeah, um, I'll answer the first question. Um, yeah. Like you guys said again, frustrated and annoyed. Honestly, um, me personally, I feel as though whenever we're extended with our resources, just because they want some type of diversity, it's a problem. But when it's the white man getting a job for one of his, like his friend's son, it's totally fine. So me personally, of course I get annoyed by it, but like the work ethic shows, I'm, we're able to do the job and even better. Um, it shouldn't really just be judged based on our color. And that's honestly, I find that dumb. I, I'm sorry, but I really find that just ignorant that you can say that I'm not equipped to do this job because of the color of my skin. I yeah. got this job because of the color of my skin and it really doesn't correlate at all. And um, to the second question, I have to agree with you guys again, but one thing that my student body really interacts with is really social media. Um, social media, and we have our alumni, um, Benny G. Thompson, who is our congressman for the US. Um, yeah. So one thing we see whenever anyone is really coming at him, it really affects us. So we make sure that we go over there and stand our ground um, and to get the students really involved, we try to go over there and just correlate it to the things that they're actually interested in. Because honestly, they connect better with parties. They connect better when we have little concerts and things like that. So why not have a concert that goes over there and stems around voting rights, that stems mm -hmm. around social justice issues, economic mm -hmm. issues. So it's just being able to give them the information, but make it acceptable for our generation. So just building a bridge and making sure that we're getting our message across while having a great time doing it. And I want to make one more comment in terms of that, because Justin made a really good point, two really good points. The first one in terms of, you know, they, I'm just going to call them they, I don't want to keep calling them white people, but they <laughs> utilize their resources. So because your granddaddy built the library, now all of a sudden you get a full ride to Stanford or whatever. So it's like that scene is okay. Like that's excusable. We understand it. We respect it. Okay, cool. Like if that's mm -hmm. cool, then mm -hmm. I don't understand why DE and I isn't either. So it's just, it's the lack of being held to the same standard. Like if we're going to excuse right. one thing, then let's, I don't want to say excuse it all, but let's actually use, let everyone use the tools that have been granted to them. Yeah. And then the other kind of side of it is just labeling people as, you know, DEI scholar or DEI employee. Because who's to say that they even got hired for DEI? Like we're just assuming that because they're black, which is just racist within itself. Right. So. Right. It's just we can never actually be seen for having like qualifications or being successful. It's automatically a conversation of, well, they only got it because we needed a little bit of diversity, you know. So it's just, yeah, it's frustrating. Yeah, but. yeah. I, I think the the initial point in which you were making, Miss Rice, um, revolving around specifically using the library example, is like legacy admissions and whatnot, um, which we see to be very prevalent not only on college campuses but nepotism throughout the workplace and just access uh, in a wide variety of different ways. And and then to all of y'all's point uh, revolving around um, the labeling of, of how individuals like to, to call us based off of their preconceived notions, which are often rooted in based of racism, is something that we're just not gonna stand for. And that's why personally, I have so much respect for Black Borders Matter um, and the like and other organizations who are doing uh, similar work for convening us in, in this 
platforms to say, hey, we're, we're going to have tangible conversations um, about these topics and then allow us to be educated and then go out and fight. So, you know, we're, we're, we're coming up on um, an hour and, and close to our time. I want to uh, I, I saw in the comments there was one question about um, some ways and the best way to approach someone to help them see how DEI is being politicized. But I see you all have answered that in, in a wide variety of different ways. I think I think Brother Clemson or excuse me, uh, whomever Clemson Terregano is, uh, they, they answered that. Um, so so good stuff. And, and I want to allow you all the opportunity and we'll start with uh, Dr. Brown Pelham um, to provide some closing remarks, if you will, uh, in anything in which you'd like to share as we move forward. And we'll we'll go with uh, Dr. Brown Pelham and then um, Dr. Rice and then Dr. Cook and then Dr. Williams. I'll just offer the words of great ancestor, Toni Morrison, who said that the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. Mm. It keeps you from doing your work. It mm. keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and you spend 20 years proving that you do. Mm. And so I encourage all of us to not allow it to be as much of a distraction as it is meant to be. And instead, look back at the work of folks like Mary McLeod Bethune, who used it as motivation to establish a college, um, other Black women, men, uh, Black men and women educators who you know, taught under trees. Booker T. Washington taught under a tree in, in an in a old shanty uh, for the first classes at Tuskegee. Uh, when Carter G. Woodson went to Harvard, his dissertation advisors told him Black folks had no history worth studying. And instead, he envisioned something that would allow us to, again, legitimize, professionalize, and popularize uh, the study of ourselves. So again, I think the examples are, are there as long as we keep the distractions at bay. Mm. Mm. Well said. Dr. Rice. I would say the biggest I, advice, piece of advice, something that I would recommend everyone else to do is to first hone in on yourself. This fight is a long fight. It's a tireless fight, but I think the first thing that I always tell like people around me, my counterparts, is to identify your passion and how it can keep you rooted in the cause too. So mm -hmm. if you're not really passionate about things like this, then you're not gonna wanna fight when things get hard. So it's really important to acknowledge what you truly care about and what will affect the community around you, your parents, the people who come after you. Um, and I also think it's really important to hone in on yourself in terms of strengths and things you bring to the table. There's a place in a fight for everyone. So it's truly good to know what you're good at. So if I always tell like students around me, you know, if you're really good at content creation, then sit down and make an infographic about just various things pertaining, breaking down a complex social issue and turning it into photos for students. So if someone else could understand yeah. what's being said or understand what's being presented around this as well. So I just think it's really important to fo um, first kind of focus on yourself, hone in on yourself, what your passion is, what you're good at, and educate yourself. You can't go around telling people different things if you don't even know the answer yourself. So it's really important to educate your own self on issues that are going around when then you can educate others who are around. So, yeah. Well said. Well said. Well said. Dr. Cook. Okay. I also agree with Dr. Rice about um, having to look through yourself and make sure that you know what you're talking about, looking for your gift. But also, I believe that um, I would like to encourage others to stay informed and also to share the news that's prevalent, you know, you know, within our within just the black community. And another thing I would like to encourage people, I would like to encourage people to think for themselves because a lot of a lot of bad things happen because people don't think for themselves. They're told from someone else, they're told from their parents, they're told from their teachers, they're told from someone they may look up to, but it's not necessarily the right thing that's happening. So I would like to encourage students, anyone to start thinking for themselves and actually thinking, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Is what I'm doing is good? Is what is, what is what I'm doing is bad? How is this affecting other people? How is this affecting myself? Just being able to critically think about the things that are, you know, that are happening. Critically think about the legislation that they're supporting. Critically mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, the things that they're actually saying. And so, yes, I would say to think. 
Well said, well said, well said. Yes, sir. Um, I would actually say, learn about your rights. Learn about your rights, use your voice, and understand your power. Okay. What we really lack is just that single thought of knowing how much power we have by ourselves and the mm -hmm. power that we can have as a collective. Yeah. We can yeah. truly get things done. A minority is only seen as a minority when they back down. We can really stand up and really fight for change. Mm. Well said, well said. Well, I really, on behalf of Black Voters Matter and, and all of our listeners, want to thank you all for your time, your energy, the wisdom and gems. Um, Dr. Brown Pelham, thank you so much for educating us tonight. And please continue to work and be safe down there in Florida, my dear sister, uh, Dr. Rice, Dr. Cook, Dr. Williams, you three student leaders who are not just student leaders, but you're all leaders of our people. And we appreciate the work and what you're doing. Thank you for dropping gems. And again, man, thank you infamously for Black Voters Matter for putting this kind of work together in these panels. Um, shout out to my guy, Cliff, and shout out to Tanisha um, and, and our dear sister Brown. Thank you uh, to everybody who have put this together. And we, we love you all. All the folks behind the scenes, in front of the camera, behind the camera. Thank you all and everybody who tuned in. We appreciate you. And until next time, we'll catch you. Much love and respect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Much.